Thank you guys so much for yet another Zoom meeting. It seems like that's what, what the world looks like today. Hopefully we'll all be getting back together soon. This is a controversial topic, admittedly. And so I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page as we sort of get to where we are today in terms of treatment of feline infectious peritonitis. Um, keep this guy in mind, this is Smokey. You're gonna be seeing more of him as we go along. And, and I would tell you that for every one of the pictures that you see of a cat um, with um, a name be beside it, that's a cat that has survived feline infectious peritonitis. So that's the sort of summary slide at the end, but it's really an important thing for you to keep in mind as we go through this today. So corona, this is a coronavirus, just like uh, the one that's plaguing all of us these days. It's a large family of RNA viruses. It affects mammals and birds. And it's prone to mutation, as we all know. Um, it is, because it's an RNA virus, it doesn't have very good editing or spell check. And so you get, end up with viruses that mutate the longer they're in different, in different species and the more the virus mutates, then the worse it gets. So we see animal transmission to humans as we think may have happened. Um, in COVID, but no one's quite sure. In cats, um, unlike COVID-19, the virus can live seven weeks in dry conditions. It's just, uh, it can live on surfaces of any kind. So it becomes a really important uh, for disinfection to be um, really uh, detailed when you're wor working with coronavirus. At feline enteric coronavirus is mild or in apparent signs. It's widespread, especially found in high density cat situations. And it's really not very significant. Most cats are feline coronavirus positive. Most of them never get sick from it. Um, but it is the virus that ends up becoming the FIP virus within the cat in conjunction with an inappropriate humoral response. So what we see is the normal feline enteric coronavirus lives in the gut, gets passed in feces, and in FIP goes the other way towards monocytes and macrophages, and that's where the trouble comes in. So FIP is a mutation within the cat. It, is tro it has a tropism for macrophages, and what that means is it likes macrophages the best, and that's where, it, that where, it, that's where it spends its time. It is the immune system interaction that causes FIP within the single cat disseminates throughout the body. And we're gonna talk about a little bit about the pathophysiology of that in a minute. Because, it's had, because it has all of these uh, abilities to change, it has high mutability. That means it, it can go and hide from the immune system. Shed, uh, FECV is shed by the fecal oral route, not in saliva or other fluids. So it gets pooped out and, um, and then groomed off uh, it tends to occur mostly in young cats. The question about coronavirus titers, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, is that cat, young cats shed coronavirus after a week of, of infection. Some of them shed continuously after that. Some shed off and on, and some never shed. So the question of coronavirus titer value is really out there. This is one of the studies that we want to talk about here uh, about where it's found. This was a study done in, in Turkey, Istanbul. This is 169 cats that were sick. The uh, coronavirus prevalence was 37%, so not really very high compared to what we see around here. There was no differences between males, females, or breed. And well, that'll come up again. Highest in multi-cat households with outdoor access. So, any, um, any kind of stressor increases the, the volume of coronavirus in the environment. Out of that group of cats, wet FIP occurred in 19% of all ill cats. 93% um, were COV positive with ascites and abdominal enlargement. There was no definitive diagnosis attempted, but it's not as hard as, as we think to assume, especially with the wet form, what FIP looks like. This is another one also done in Turkey, University of Ankara, 26 cats, um, one from a cat household, three from three other cat, cat households who were healthy, 
and the remaining were all village cats. 14 were positive uh, or 54% were positive for coronavirus mRNA by RT-PCR. And that's gonna come up again when we talk about diagnosis. So keep that test in mind. 13 though were healthy and only one was sick. So the coronavirus PCR um, on blood is really not very effective. So there's no diagnostic assays that distinguish virulent and avirulent forms of feline coronavirus. So, so you really can't tell very much from coronavirus titer. So the two of them are in, uh, side by side. The enteric coronavirus is benign, highly infectious. So if you get one in the household, everybody's gonna have it. It's shed in feces and stays in the colon. FIP on the other hand, virulent, very infrequent spread, not shed in the feces and it's cell associated as we said. So very, and, and we used to say that there were some breeds that were more susceptible. It turns out they're bloodlines that are, seem to be more susceptible, but really not breeds um, because we find the same breeds around the world um, and the ones that we thought susceptible, more susceptible are not depending upon where they are and where they came from. So the host factors are the immune response to coronavirus, this exaggerated humoral response and the inadequate cell mediated immune response. So an ineffective antibody response is a failure to clear the viruses and that just allows the disease to go on and on and on. And that's one of the things that we're gonna be talking about as we talk about interrupting the virus in an in a individual cat. So there are two forms, as you know, um, the wet form, which is, has no cell mediated immune response. The dry form has a weak one. And then if you have a strong cell mediated immune response, your immune system is gonna clear it. So this is really an interaction of a virus with the individual um, immune system of the cat. But all of it, whether it's dry or wet, all of it is vasculitis. It's just a difference in the way that it's spread. You get focal lesions in organs in the dry form, including ocular and neurologic. And then in the wet form, you get widespread vascular permeability extensive granulomas, but it's all about inflammation. Everything in this is about the inflammatory response within the single cat. The signs you all probably recognize more commonly are weight loss, fever, inappetence. These cats tend to lose weight pretty quickly. They don't look so good. Some of them get yellow. And of course, the ascites in some of them. Very, very commonly ascites, not so commonly uh, pleural effusion, but the real rare signs are cutaneous, the scrotal enlargement I've only seen once in 22 years, granulomas in the lymph nodes, which I've also seen only once, um, some adhesions because of the presence of ascites, and the granulomas found in the cecum colitis can give them soft stool and blood and mucus in the stool. So those are the less common ones that we'll see, and we won't be focusing on those so much. We see in the ocular form changes in the retina, iritis, irregular pupil size. You can see in this micrograph, the inflammatory cells surrounding the, uh, the retinal vessels. And that's a classic example of the, the appearance of a retinal exam in a cat with ocular FIP. Hypopion meiosis, keratic precipitates and aqueous flare. So just a, an eye that looks like this one on the on this cat's left eye. CNS signs are frequently found and in a young cat with neuro signs, you need to put FIP on at the top of the list. They can be with ocular or GI too, um, mostly ocular more than GI. Sometimes these cats will have seizures, they have personality changes, paresis and paralysis is quite common. Circling, cir circling with a head tilt, um, all of those kinds of things. And then incontinence, of course. So this is a, a, a video of a cat with neurologic FIP. You can see he looks scruffy, skinny. He has all the other signs that you would associate generally with FIP but he also has some a, a neurologic appear, appearance to him. And he looks sort of spaced out, I think. Coronavirus, as I said, is not FIP. And 
the coronavirus titer does not tell you very much of anything about active breeding programs. So if people are screening for coronavirus, it's not really going to tell you anything about shedding. It doesn't tell you about whether they'll shed, whether they won't, um, and when, we're, when they will and when they won't, and to the degree that they do. So your coronavirus titer is not a very helpful thing. You can even have FIP with a negative coronavirus titer. And this is Paige, a survivor. So what, you need, what do you need to do to diagnose it? You need to build your diagnostic wall. It's not as hard as we have made it. Um, diagnosing FIP, of course, is fairly easy in, in the uh, wet form, a little bit harder in the dry form, but really I think we make it a lot harder than, than we should. So it's gathering of evidence. Uh, young cats, particularly purebred cats, in multi-cat situations, so if you have a situation of crowding in young cats present, it's particularly in the presence of many cats of varying different ages, that stressor within the household will certainly be a part of the, the constellation that you're building as you put your diagnostic wall together. And then there'll be this sudden onset of lethargy and anorexia and really quick weight loss. These cats go from looking normal to looking really sick in a day. Waxing and waning fever. Um, I often will get these cats as a second opinion because they went to their veterinarian. Veterinarian said, oh, I just got a fever of unknown origin, put them on antibiotics, the fever goes away. And then the fever comes back. Well, the, the antibiotics didn't have anything to do with that. And it, it's just a matter of this, this fever just sort of comes and goes. So these are the typical signs you need to look for. And when you, um, when you look at Romy on the pictures on the right, you can see many of the signs of dry FIP. Diagnosis really isn't as hard as we make it. It's more difficult, as I said, with a non-effusive form. In young cats, half of the effusions at least are FIP. So it's gotta be number one on your differential list in a young cat with ascites. The effusion fluid looks Pretty characteristic. It's straw-colored viscous with a low cell content. Um, you can can do um, immune fluorescent antibody and RT-PCR on the fluid. Um, if, if you have access to the to a Revolta test, which simply is a matter of a little bit of uh, household vinegar and water, and there's a couple of pretty good YouTube videos on how to run it. So if you're if you're questioning your diagnosis, a Revolta test will add to your diagnostic wall pretty inexpensively. They also have an anemia, pretty commonly neutrophilia and leukocytosis. So um, your CBC is going to also add to your diagnostic wall. This is the key, though, an albumin globulin ratio of less than 0 0.6. And that's going to come into play later when we talk about monitoring these cats for recovery. Um, that is a really classic sign and one that you really need to pay attention to if you see this kind of ratio on blood work in a young cat. But it isn't as hard as we make it, and it's because we don't want to diagnose it. Up until recently, it has been fatal and heartbreaking to report to a client that their young, beloved kitten um, is going to die of FIP. And we also have to have to say that a, a PCR of blood is insensitive. There is um, a feline coronavirus seven B RNA PCR of the infusion, which is but you have to be sure that you trust your lab. And so interrogate your lab if you wanna run this test because you will get um, a good result, a reliable result if you trust your lab, but also trust yourself. Um, we make it hard because we don't wanna diagnose it. And so we have to be really cautious about doing too many tests and spending too much money, um, trying to be 100% confident. Um, there are better ways to spend money um, now that I'll show you. This is what a cat with ascites looks like. This is the classic appearance of the fluid. When you shake it up, it's got a nice proteinaceous bubbles on the top that looks, is just classic for FIP. The gold standard, of course, is histopathology or has been up until recently. Um, the, this is a cat that um, I posted that had uh, the wet form of FIP, and because I, I wanted you to see what this looks like. It looks like a combination of both. Um, when you look carefully at the organs, you can see granulomas of the kidneys and all throughout the body entirely. So when you're, um, when you're 
um, looking at these cats, if you're thinking about an exploratory laparotomy, I don't think that's necessary anymore. It used to be the way we were forced to think about diag diagnostics, but it's, it just doesn't seem to be true. This is a close up of, I took the capsule off the kidney to show you how dr the drama associated with the granulomas in a cat with, um, with FIP. So wouldn't it be nice if there was an FIP vaccine? Well, there might be um, sooner now than later, but the, the problem was that um, the, a report of the, uh, on the vaccine of a um, modified live virus derived from virulent FIP was an intranasal vaccine that was put out a number of years ago. The mean efficacy in specific pathogen-free cats was 69%. That's pretty good. Um, not as good as some of the RNA virus vaccines we have today, but, but not bad when you think about it. But it turned out that there was no, in cats who had coronavirus in their catteries, there's just no benefit to the vaccine in cats that already have a coronavirus titer present in their body. So disease incidence wasn't ameliorated at all. So now we don't have a vaccine for a, for a, a, a lethal uh, form of a disease. So, so it's a, a at least it was a pretty serious problem. It is a safe vaccine, but not a very efficacious one. And I um, got into a lot of uh, discussions in Europe about this simply because they wanted to use it despite the data. But in fact, you, there's just no, no benefit to it. It's just ineffective once cats have been exposed to the virus. So, so don't bother. Um, but it just also means that there was really good reason to look for a way to cure it. Um, and beginning in 2003, um, the, the work began in humans with the outbreak of MERS, SARS, and the Ebola virus. And that <clears throat> was looking for an inhibition via nucleoside analog. And that, so anybody that says that the vaccine um, today is not, is a new vaccine that can't be trusted, this work has been going on for, all, for 18 years at least. Um, both for a cure and for a vaccine. So it just simply isn't true that this is new technology. So why, why look for a cure to FIP? Vaccines are ineffective, as we said. It's pre prevention in a multi-cat household is really hard. I mean, especially when there's some crowding and the husbandry isn't really up to snuff. You get a ton of coronavirus and present, and so somebody is going to get it. Um, it, it occurs in 0.3 to 1.4% of all cats. So what does that mean? There's 60 million pet cats in the United States. That gives us a potential of 600,000 cases of FIP. That's probably not how many occur, but, but it gives you a, a reason to think that there's gotta be a way to cure this disease because it occurs so frequently. So antiretroviral drug therapy looked like a really good place to focus our attention because of the absence of a vaccine and the virulence of this disease. So what happened in, in March of 2016? If you guys don't know about PLOS One, this is a free online uh, uh, peer-reviewed journal that usually very often publishes before paper publication. So there, it's a place to find some really good information. There was a, a first publication in, uh, in 2016 of a reversal of the progression of fatal coronavirus infection in cats by a broad spectrum coronavirus protease inhibitor. So first of all, this was experimental FIP. This is Sri Racha, who also survived. Once clinical signs appeared in these cats that were artificially infected, the protease required viral, rep we learned that protease is required for viral replication. So we needed to be, to look at the proteases as a way to target um, a treatment. The improvement in clinical signs in these cats was, um, was really fast, 20 days or less to reduce viral load. It turns out that we learned from this that unlike a lot of other viral infections where the virus itself can be actually gone and still be symptoms present in the body, continuous viral replications required for progression of immune-mediated inflammatory disease. So in this particular case of the coronaviruses, you have to have virus present and replicating in order to have, to have disease persistence. So that was really important information to get out of this study. This was GC376. We learned it was safe. There were two efficacy studies. There are four specific pathogen-free cats. 
um, with mild signs. Four SPF cats with ascites fluid that were infected. These cats had profound signs. Um, they had jaundice, lymphopenia, and mild to profound ascites, weight loss, and fever, so the classic signs of FIP. Two in the serious profound group were euthanized before treatment because they were just that, just too sick. Um, but the other six recovered. So now we have the beginnings of what, what could be a cure for FIP. Now that is, will be called Anavive. And that drug is out there. Um, it's about two years out for FDA approval. So it's not something we can rely upon right now, um, but it's, it was the foundation and the basis for some things that came later. So these are the cats, um, the eight cats in that group, um, two euthanized and six recovered. So this was a really good, important beginning. So, <coughs> pardon me. So then the test, is, it, was, it was time to test on um, pet cats. So not artificially infected cats were tested. Six of the 20 remain in remission today. One of them was smoking. So you're gonna see him again. 14 of the cats that went back, when came out of remission, did not respond to retreatment. So there was something wrong with what we were doing with this drug. Some thought, thought it might be the treatment duration. Each cat was treated for 12 weeks. There was a smallish sample size, of course, only 20 cats. Um, that might have been some drug resistance. We just didn't know at that point what the ideal dose was, but six of the 20 cats did respond. And one of them was our guy Smokey here that you saw earlier. And you could see his big belly from ascites. And that's him um, upon his recovery. He developed um, something that you're gonna hear about again in the next drug, a series of granulomas that had to be removed. They were, there was the diluent um, required for this drug is a little bit acidic and it creates some wounds. And that's where I think the Assisi loop comes in because they're painful. And I think that adding in a, um, the Assisi technology to a cat that's getting um, injected every day is probably a pretty good idea. So he had his granulomas removed and this is Smokey today. So he was one of the original cats in the pet cat study of GC. So GC is different than what we're gonna be talking about now, um, which is GS441524. And this was published in 2019. Um, this is a kitty you can see him at, with his FIP symptoms on the left and his present day look on the right. And he was one of the cats in this group. And this is the guy that did it. This is Dr. Nils Peterson um, with the help of the Wind Feline Foundation, which is now called Every Cat Health Foundation and money from other nonprofits. They started with 31 cats, um, 3.4 to 73 month, months old, 18 domestic, uh, 13 ped pedigree cats, 26 with effusive form, five with non, four were euthanized between day two and five, once again, because they were just too sick to, to put through the, the treatment. Um, one was uh, euthanized on day 26 for a, a different, not a non-disease related reason. The, these cats were given 12 weeks of G, GS. And in this particular case, neuro cases were included. They were excluded before because it was unknown whether or not this drug would cross the uh, blood brain barrier, but it, it seemed that it might. So these cats were included. The treatment outcomes for this study were 18 resolved in the first 12 weeks. Um, eight relapsed and were retreated at a higher dose. And of those eight, seven out of eight survived. There was one unrelated death. I can't remember why that cat died, but it was related to FIP. So right now, as we speak, 24 of the cats out of the, the 30 treated with GS survived past publication. And one of them was this guy, Marvin. The interesting thing here is that in G, with GS, the, the signs disappeared even more rapidly. Um, 12 to 36 hours, ocular signs uh, disappeared. The fever went to, went to normal thermic. Their appetite increased in activity. 10 to 14 days with effusions, two to four weeks for jaundice. And after that, these cats became um, outwardly normal. So this is Grayson, another cat that was treated for FIP. So when we look at the future of FIP, we need to think about the way that we characterize uh, FIP to our clients 
because it's no longer something that they need to assume their cat will die from. So what did we learn? Hyperglobulinemia and that antigen globulin ratio is a really good marker of the degree of disease these cats have and also a degree of recovery. The pedigreed cats responded every bit as well as the non-pedigreed cats. The older cats did as well as the younger cats. It was a safe drug. There was no, no evidence of toxicity, no dental abnormalities, and some, but much fewer injection, injection site reactions. So we learned some more now from this study of GS as a, a new form of antiretroviral therapy. And that's when things got ugly. <clears throat> The, um, there were two developers, Gilead and Merck, who were um, in, in the process of supporting and developing this drug for FDA approval, and they backed out. Despite the good outcomes, this wasn't good enough for them because they felt that um, developing a human drug in some way might jeopardize the human form called remdesivir that they were developing. So now we lost our legitimate form of production of this drug in the United States. So a very big setback um, that, that was very, very disappointing to everyone involved. <clears throat> and what, we, what, what that led to is a truly unruly black market. But something, something came in to fill the market. So multiple companies, mostly out of China, reverse engineered it and developed um, GS and began to sell it. There are competing websites. This one um, that you see on your screen is one of the companies that makes GS and is not the legitimate FIP Warriors 5.0 that I'm gonna be sending you to. On Facebook, there are a lot of fakes. Company sites, as I said, there are trusted ones and I'm gonna tell you where to find them. I will also tell you that this is a worldwide effort um, that it, um, I, we just returned from teaching in Peru, where I met two veterinarians who are in the process of treating two cats there using this, the, this form of therapy that we're gonna be talking about for the rest of the time. And I, I sort of raced through the pathophysiology because you all know it, but it, because I wanted to get to what you can do about it. I also wanna make sure that we, we really do work at building a diagnostic wall and not insist on the thousands and thousands of dollars of tests when there are other ways to accomplish the same thing. So FIP Warriors is where to go. <clears throat> Facebook took down the first four. Um, that's why it's now FIP Warriors uh, 5.0. FIP uh, or Facebook rather has some very specific rules about what you can and cannot do on their site. And so um, we apparently, at the, in the early days, violated those rules and we were taken down. We do not violate them anymore. Um, this is a carefully coordinated effort on a part of about 6,000 members um, to provide the, uh, uh, the source for uh, this unregulated drug in a form that can be useful for veterinarians and their patients. <clears throat> Pardon me. I, as I said, it's the Wild West. These are a couple of websites that are illegitimate websites. They call themselves FIP Warriors 5.0. They are websites created by one of the Chinese manufacturers of, of GS and should be avoided. You won't get the help you need from them in the first place. And in the second, um, there are some ways in which you can get the most appropriate and best tested drug um, directly from FI, the legitimate FIP Warriors 5.0. This is another way you can get to the really good information about FIP. Um, this was one of, this was Smokey's dad. He's also a friend of mine and has dedicated a nonprofit to the cure of FIP. Um, and his website, the House of Neko, or zenbycat.com, which is the name of the website, if you forget how to get to FIP Warriors uh, 5.0, or you just wanna make sure that you're on the um, latest uh, and best source for legitimate help with FIP, go to zenbycat.com. He always keeps his website up to date with what the latest news is in terms of support for FIP treatment. 
He's also a really nice guy. So the problem is that it's not an FDA approved drug. It's not even a, a, approved for anything. It's obviously we use non-FDA approved drugs for a lot of things um, and don't get in much trouble about it. Um, in this case, you can. And so what I want you to understand and understand in detail is what you can and what you cannot do when, when treating this, this um, disease. I still get second opinion cases from a lot of veterinarians who say your cat has FIP and needs to be euthanized. And I want you, my message is clear, it is no longer a disease for which euthanasia is the only potential outcome. You do have to be careful. So here's what you can do. You can direct clients to trusted resources like FIP Warriors 5.0, you can show them what the website looks like. You can send them to Facebook, uh, FYP Warriors 5.0, or the website, either one, um, and tell them how to get there. You can provide supportive care. <clears throat> you can teach the clients how to administer medications. You can give uh, adjunct medications, B12, subcutaneous fluids, appetite stimulants, whatever it is that you would ordinarily provide for a cat who's quite ill, um, you can do all of those things as you would normally. You can also connect people who are in different stages of treatment. So if people are really having trouble getting their mind around giving their cat a subcutaneous injection. Um, you can not only teach them how to do that without using the GS itself, or you can direct them to humans who are in the process of treating their own cats or have treated them in the past. So these are the things that you really can do. You can also say, we should repeat a CBC uh, Chem 14 monthly during treatment. You can talk to them about side effects and you can help them make dose adjustments. One of the things that's important is dose adjustments have to be made as these cats begin to, to improve because they gain a considerable amount of weight. And you can help them with those calculations and tell them when it is appropriate for them to adjust the dose. What you cannot do is acquire GS. You can't go on the website and get a source for it. You can't get it from anybody else. You can't even get preliminary doses to start treatment before the actual purchased product is available. You can't do any of that um, without putting your license Elizabeth, I think we lost sound on you. Where am I? I can hear you. Oh, where did it go? Uh oh. There it is. There it is. Okay. This is a really important part, so I don't want to miss it. So, so that so what you cannot do is buy any of this stuff. Um, what you can do is what you cannot do is administer it either. So if you're teaching how to give subcutaneous uh, injections, you cannot use the drug to administer it. <clears throat> Neither one, or, nor, nor can you, as of course veterinarians cannot, and are they not mind readers, you cannot guarantee outcomes. Here is a recent um, study of 164 cats with FIP, just to give you an idea of how we're looking at these cats who are undergoing therapy. This was um, cats that, were began, that began treatment in um, October of 2019. Of those cats, three relapsed, eight had death from other causes, 11 died of FIP, 70 were cured. And one of the things that we do in this is there's a 12 week post treatment period in which these cats are observed and not considered cured. So until they go through a 12 week post treatment period, they are considered in treatment and not cured. And so, um, so these are cats that, are, that, um, that we are still worried about potential for relapse. And so they, we don't put them in the cure list until they've actually uh, gone through the 12 week post treatment period. There are two forms of GS. There's an oral form that's more recently been made available. 
It, it provides an increased concentration of the drug. There are three companies. Um, there are more um, probably by now, but Mutian, Aura, and Lucky are the three manufacturers. When you get this drug, GS is not on the ingredients list. It comes up as something like a food supplement or a vitamin or uh, an appetite uh, adjunct therapy or something like that. Um, it, you will not find GS on the label. The dose is based upon the form, but it generally is 20 to 40% higher in price than, uh, than, than the subcutaneous form. And mutian is about four times more expensive than subcutaneous. So, so um, when you're thinking about how, which form to select, you also have to consider which is gonna be the easiest on the client. The subcutaneous injection is cheaper and dosing is more accurate. Um, we will talk about dosing in a minute, but um, with the subcutaneous form, you can adjust doses more precisely. It also is better absorbed. Um, however, we did talk a little bit earlier about injection site pain, and those can there's a, a potential for sores to develop. They are treated topically, but they can be a little painful. And once again, that's where your uh, sort of uh, compassionate form of pain management comes in the form of, for example, an SCC loop, um, which I've used uh, quite commonly. This is Oscar, he also survived. So, um, and these are the doses. This is where you, the gener where you generally start. Um, wet or dry, four to six milligrams per kilogram per day, but not in the ocular or neuro variety. It takes more drug to cross the ocular blood barrier and the neuro and the uh, blood brain barrier requires an even higher dose. <clears throat> so with the ocular form, eight, you started at eight milligrams per kilogram neuro is 10. Um, if you're going greater than 10 mg per kilogram, which in some cases you will, you really can't use the oral form. The absorption goes down. The other thing we want to talk about is those injection site sores. We want to make sure that people are, are instructed to put the injection, we always tend to inject it in a fairly regular site and when we give subcutaneous injections, you wanna vary it all over the, the body where there's loose skin so that you can keep that discomfort under control um, and make sure that you instruct the clients that way. So these are the starting doses. Um, according to Dr. Peterson, his number is about 85% cure rate so far. So of, of all the cats treated, and I'm gonna show you a recent <clears throat> a recent uh, study in a minute. The things that you need to help clients make sure they're keeping an eye on is weekly monitoring physical um, activity and weight, appetite, and of course, the whatever presenting clinical signs these cats have. Um, and then every four weeks, we like to see a CBC chemistry with an a uh, antigen globulin ratio included. And that is a really helpful way to monitor progress and make sure that you're on the right dose um, and this cat is actually improving. Make sure that they know how to topically treat these in injection site lesions. Um, it's not, they don't need to be shaved. They just need to be treated with a topical form like hydrogen peroxide and maybe a little um, antibiotic ointment, that kind of thing. As I said before, um, weight gain will occur as these cats improve and they need to have their dose uh, modified for weight gain. And lastly, there, there is some drug resistance that happens. And so you may have to go to much higher doses to um, explore whether or not the resistance is, is complete or incomplete. You may get, with resistance, you may get uh, improvement on a much higher dose, but you have to know that. So this is the unlicensed crowdsourced at-home survey that was done on GAS patients. Um, this is Lily Blue, a, another survivor. There were 393 surveys filled out on this Facebook site. Um, and they explored the uh, mean cost in US dollars was about $4,900. Um, I just got back from Peru, which is 20,000 sol, which sounds really hor horrendous, but it's still quite expensive. Um, it used to cost about four times that much. So the cost is coming down, but it's still pretty considerable. And another good reason to use your diagnostic wall and not do thousands of dollars worth, worth of unnecessary diagnostics so that you can, because maybe you can get these cats 
begin treatment when they still have some money left. Out of three, 393, now remember, this was just voluntary um, a crowdsourced survey. 380 of these, the 390 were alive at the time of, they were 88% uh, improved in one week. Now, here's where it's interesting. You can get uh, pretty quickly, like an overnight mail, you can get some doses um, from uh, FIP Warriors 5.0. And if you're still thinking that this might not be FIP, you can start treatment and, and see if the cat improves in a, in a it's begin to, to improve diagnostic signs in a couple, of, a couple of days, because that will confirm the diagnosis. So if the clients are running out of money um, or they don't have the money to start with to do exhaustive diagnostics, this is one way that people have skirted that issue to come to a conclusion, particularly about the dry form of FIP. So 96.7 were alive at the time of the, this was done. 54% of those cats were basically cured. So they had gone through the 12 week uh, treatment period or longer, depending on whether they'd relapsed or not. And 43% um, of them were still in the 12 week observation period. And that is a remarkable number. And though it certainly was voluntary, so a lot of people didn't wanna probably tell their sad story, some, somewhere around 85% uh, cure rate is, is, according to Dr. Peterson, what you can pretty much count on. And Dr. Peterson is, has the pulse of all of this. He spent the last 30 years working on nothing else um, but a cure for FIP because it's such a deadly problem for so long. Now, the other thing that, that people are doing is starting at a higher dose than I showed you, four to six mg per kg. They start at 6.5 to 8.5 mg per kg. Um, so the question is whether this new form of GS coming out of uh, some companies in China might be a little less pure, um, might not be quite as, uh, as efficacious as the one used in the clinical trials. Um, it, it's uncertain, but the veterinarians who are on FIP Warriors 5.0 help out with um, getting started on the appropriate dose depending upon the cat's si signs. So here's the things you don't need to do. This is Cat Stevens, he recovered. You don't need to get rid of the abdominal effusion by any mechanical way. In fact, it's, I would recommend that you don't. Um, unless the cat's having difficulty breathing because of, of the compression of the diaphragm, don't remove the effusion, it'll go away. If as some do, these cats are on corticosteroids for, because that sometimes helps ameliorate some of the signs and makes the cat more comfortable, stop it. Um, just stop, don't treat, don't taper, don't do anything else, just stop. And there's no other need for any other supplements or vitamins or anything else. And there's no need to test any more frequently or any more in depth than what we talked about. Unless you have a, a, some comorbidities that you're worried about, um, there's an awful uh, tendency to see some um, over expenditures of, of inappropriate treatments for these cats. There are treatment failures. Um, this is Little Bird. He's not one of them. I'll show you in a minute. Um, improper dosage adjustment. Poor quality GS. Remember, these are coming out of uh, people, companies that are pr basically producing this for the black market. Um, you can get drug resistance. You could be wrong about your diagnosis. Some people just can't afford it. Um, and other people... Uh, other cats have uh, other forms of disease that are interfering with, um, with treatment. However, Little Bird now today looks like this. Um, people always ask, when do I stop? Well, usually it's about 12 weeks, but basically it's about overall health. How are these cats doing? And it's not necessarily based on one test. I keep telling people on um, FIP Warriors, they, they'll write in about one thing that's still a little bit off, like ALKFOS will still be up a little bit, or the anemia hasn't 100% resolved. Not really relevant. What you wanna know is, is this cat eating well, gaining weight, um, playful, having uh, resuming its own, um, his own behaviors. Because of the presence of effusion, ultrasounds re may remain abnormal, especially with adhesions and other appearance to the abdomen, the ultrasound may remain abnormal and that just is the way it's gonna be. Um, relapses occur, um, retreat for eight weeks minimum and you wanna to go to a five milligram per kilogram higher dose. So if you were on five mg per kg, you get a relapse, you go to 10. 
Um, and, and that's just a rule of thumb. And this has been part of the evolution of this treatment uh, as we go through and find new ways of, uh, of interrogating these cases, we're learning more and more about what works and what doesn't. And this is the current thinking on, um, on this process. Now, there are some groups out there that um, do some weird things. Um, Theo recovered from FIP. Um, some of them will pick up, and these are smaller groups that got together and, and talked to each other. They'll start out at a higher dose at the beginning, or they'll add weeks of a high dose. Some of them will put on, add in interferon or some immunostimulants. Some of them will add in GC that we talked about earlier and other supplements. There's just no data. And so if you, know, if you feel strongly about doing something, um, do it for that particular case, but don't as a matter of course, think that you have to, to add in a, a, a number of different costly medications. Um, for this cat, um, unless this particular individual cat might need a little help um, with appetite or something like that. Just keep it simple so we can get to cure. So COVID-19 and FIP, um, GC is, uh, is gonna be used with COVID-19. Um, it disables the key enzyme for replication and it works in a test tube in the monkey and in human cells. GS is, is the, the parent of remdesivir, which I'm sure you, by now you've already heard of. It speeds recovery, prevents re viral replication, which is essential for disease. Um, remdesivir works in humans better in the lungs so because pneumonias are so bad and that's a good thing. Um, right now it's in clinical trials. So it's GS is, is remdesivir, um, a, a form of that. And, it, and it's given IV, so it's a little more complicated. It would be a little more comp complicated to use remdesivir in, um, in cats, but it's being done. So it's the same thing. So in Australia, you cannot get GS or GC. It's against the law to come across the border with it. So they can't get, get GS or GC. So um, there are some doctors there who are doing some very interesting things with remdesivir. Um, there are 100 cats treated between 10, October of last year and April of this year. Uh, they, some of them with severe disease were started on IV, for a, on IV fluids for a couple of days um, and IV remdesivir. Some of the less sick ones were given the dose sub-Q. It was dose by type and severity, just like we do with GS. Ocular neuroforms require a, a, a higher dose. They also started using it as a therapeutic trial. Is this really FIP or not, and in lieu of expensive diagnostics. So in, in Australia, they're doing what we talked about. And then they um, adjusted dose based upon signs. So remdesivir is, uh, is in Australia.